Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Photographers Inside the Photographer's Mind. I'm your host Dan Jin and this week I'm joined by photographer Dina Litovsky. Dina's worked with the likes of the National Geographic, the New York Times Magazine, Time Magazine and many more leading publications in the space. Over the course of the next 30 minutes she discusses a very cool virtual portrait series that she's been putting together. We'll also be talking street photography, documentary photography, and what life has been like for her transitioning now from a photographer as well into a writer with her weekly newsletter. It's going to be a fantastic episode. And before we get into it, guys, I'd just like to remind you, if you're watching on YouTube, then please do hit a subscribe, hit a like, leave a comment and let us know what you think. Also, please do subscribe if you're listening via Spotify, Apple or Google Podcasts. Right, let's get into this conversation with Dina. Hello, Dina. Hello, Dan. <laughs> I appreciate you taking the time out of uh, your day to, to have a chat with me. How are you doing? I'm good. Uh, thank you for <laughs> chatting with me. Anyway, Absolutely. Me so you're in your, are you in your place in, are you in New York City? Yes, I'm in East Village. Oh, okay. Lovely, lovely part of the world. I, uh, I went there in 2019 and um, I love New York City. So I think, I think it's a, uh, a lovely place to live. I'd love to live there one day if I'm if I'm lucky enough. But um, but we'll see. But we're not here to talk about my wants and needs in terms of where I want to live in the world. We're going to talk about photography, and there's there's, there's a few places I'd uh, want to start. I think I'm going to start with. I, I I looked on your Instagram and I saw a portrait of you and this 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 virtual portraits that you've been kind of pushing and working on at the moment and. This is obviously a, a concept that's kind of, I, I feel it's kind of new to the photography space um, because people usually do them in person. But um, the sign of the times, I just, how, how did you get started with virtual portraits? And maybe for those who aren't quite familiar with what a virtual portrait is, kind of explain what, what it is and how it works. Right. Um, so, I mean, virtual portrait is literally taking a picture of somebody who is not in the same physical space as you. It can be next room. It can be across the world. Um, mm -hmm. There are ways to do this now after the pandemic. Um, I use an app. Basically, the app connects to the user's phone um, just as we're talking. And then I am able to, from my computer, to just take images from the person's phone. So I'm kind of hijacking their camera. And the images go straight to my phone through iCloud. So that's a very kind of basic, simple concept, I think, I feel. Um, and how I got started, well, the pandemic yeah. was a major factor. Uh, but also um, the picture you're talking about, I think the picture of me, the virtual portrait. So it was taken by my friend, Nikola Tominjik. And he's the okay. one who started doing remote photography first. Okay. Um, and I was watching what he's doing and it looked really awesome. And we were stuck in a pandemic. He took a picture of me and I was just blown away by the quality of his work. Um, what you can actually do with the virtual portraits. Yeah. So I asked them to teach me. Um, <laughs> they taught me the whole process. And I just, you know, started dabbling in it. And, you know, again, I was stuck in quarantine and magazines were not sending photographers out. And there was a need for that at the time. Yeah. I, I wonder, because how does it, in terms of the process, in terms of the enjoyment, shall we say, do you, do you enjoy doing the virtual portraits if we compare it to kind of an in-session shoe? Is it, or is it kind of more of a, well, we have to do something or, 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 or do you enjoy it? I love it. I love it. I mean, I love it more than the regular portraits because I've been struggling with regular portraits all my life. Um, I'm not a portrait photographer. I'm a documentary yeah, photographer. Exactly. It's, it's a very different interaction with the subject. Uh, usually with portraits, I had a problem that I, there were too many options to choose from. I mean, I would come into the space and I'm like, where should I shoot the person? against the wall, on a couch, what kind of lighting. There were just so many options um, that I would just get absolutely bugged out. And with virtual photography, all those options are gone. There's just not a lot of, when I, when I, for example, when a person, when I'm asking them to photograph them in their space, they only have few, so many options in that one room, by that one wall that they could put their phone in, um, that one light that they have. And instead of cho me choosing how to photograph it, I'm mm -hmm. getting just an options of how best how to like what? How to make the best of a situation? Mm -hmm. So I'm actually much better at making the best of a scan situation than being presented with a lot of options. Yeah, so it's just a, it's a it's a different challenge. So I want to talk to you about uh, documentary photography because that's obviously something you know that's what you're best known for. You are a documentary photographer, as you said, um, and obviously the the pandemic 
wouldn't let people go out into the field and work on stories. And I just wondered, what was that initial experience like? Like, were you able to to keep motivated, to keep active, or was, did you just did you have to put photography down? How did you keep busy? I guess. Uh, by switching what I was doing, I mean, the first couple of months, the first month was really hard. Well, my jobs dried up. Again, yeah, I was traveling all the time. I would be traveling like two, three times a month. And that that's all gone. Um, so I'm stuck at home. And everything that I'm photographing is gone because I'm photographing social behavior and culture and nightlife. And so all of this is dead. You know, there's nobody on the street, not even street photography. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had to completely just... Um, you know, reconfigure what I was photographing. You know, I thought I'm not going to be able to shoot until it's over, but that's not an option for me. I get, I can't, I can't just sit still. Mm -hmm. Um, So I started doing work that, let's say I would not have started doing before the pandemic uh, with the project of Dark City, which is kind of photographing silence. Mm -hmm. Um, And I can, and then continue to virtual portraits. Social behavior. I think this is, so, so now we're kind of, we're out there. We're allowed out. Um, I'm wondering if you're taking inspiration because we we are very divided at the moment. Um, even simply things like wear a mask, don't wear a mask, or and and what's going on. Are you kind of taking inspiration? May not be the right word because it's a sensitive topic. But now that there's now that we are out in the field, or you can get out in the field, um, are you interested in the social behaviour post? lockdown and how people are responding and how there is division and and kind of similarities and and things like that is is there any kind of motivation for stories there for you honestly not yet i feel like i've gotten so much social behavior done before for a decade and Mm -hmm. i'm almost enjoying looking at things differently um and i've never really photographed politics um Mm -hmm. so the divisions um i don't know maybe a little bit later once things settle down but I'm trying not to get, I'm trying to stay away from photography that kind of criticizes or makes anybody look grotesque or, mm-hmm. you know, strong opinions can do that. So I yeah. feel like I'm usually staying away from topics like that. And if I don't agree with people's opinions, I'm not, I don't specifically want to go and photograph that. Okay. Um, so I need to first think it over and, and I need to see what I can say about this, that the conversation. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. It makes perfect sense. Um, and I think, you know, that, that that's a good point to raise because a lot of photographers like to just jump into kind of maybe the juiciest story or the juiciest events that's going on um, without kind of taking a step back and thinking, you know, is it the right thing to focus their camera on or their, their energy on? And, you know, it's, it's, it's refreshing to hear that even though this is kind of the, the topical thing of, of the times, uh, the, the pandemic and how we're all reacting to it, you know, that you're able to say, hey, maybe this isn't the right story for me right now or, 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 may, or maybe ever. So it's, I think it's a, a great insight. Well, you got to, I mean, yeah, you have to be focused. You can't do everything. And I mean, I photographed politics. I photographed everything from Trump rallies to elections, uh, Trump's election party. I've done a lot of, you know, politics before, yeah. a few years of that. Um, I just feel for now I'm done with that. Um, Mm -hmm. And again, until I have something reasonable and interesting to add to the conversation, I'm not going to jump into it. Okay. So we were talking about doing some remote work and you're saying that you're going to try some um, virtual or remote street photography. Um, I imagine some street photographers right now are thinking, hang on, how, how does that, how does that work? So um, I'll give the, I'll give the floor to you. I'm still figuring it out myself. But basically, when I started doing portraits, I'm like, this, I love new technologies. To me, this is the future. The fact that I can photograph somebody across the world. I mean, my first, one of my first portrait shoots was a portrait of a Russian poetess in uh, Moscow. And it was just amazing that I could make that happen. It, to me, it was just like, I don't know, um, just travel when I, when I was stuck. And I'm like, what else can you do with this technology? Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, so instead of, basically I contacted people around the world. I just put up a call on Instagram and I said, do you have a view out of your house on the second or sec- first floor? Um, kind of like a surveillance camera view. So it's not too high, not too low. And would you let me borrow your phone for like, I don't know, 20 minutes. And a lot of people said yes. So about a hundred people replied. And so wow. I've been connecting with each person around the world and asking them to show me what's outside their window. I'm looking for the same streets. So at some cities, big cities, it, 
kind of looks, London can look the same as New York. You have little signs that it's a different city, but essentially the traffic, the streets, the intersections, the traffic lights, it's something where it's a very kind of a globalized big city network. Yeah. And so I'm kind of building a global city from such fragments from people's windows. But it's really just the beginning. I, it may completely fail. I'm just having fun with this. And I'm getting to just spy a lot of, on other people's views out of the window. Would, would you describe us when you start a project, uh, would you say that you're an optimistic person? Um, do you kind of go in with the mindset that, you know, this is going to work or like, what, what, how do you approach a, a project? Just, I asked that because you said it may fail. And I just wondered kind of how, how, how you kind of, what attitude you go in with a project when, when you start one? Is it more optimistic or more, let's just yeah, see I what think happens? Yeah, deluded optimism. I mean, I think you, everybody needs <laughs> deluded optimism to do both. You know, I'm not getting paid like this is I'm doing this for myself. So I'm devoting yeah. my time, my energy. And also kind of there is, you have to be a deluded optimist to start a project. Like, I mean, in my mind, I think it's going to be genius. Every project I think is going to be genius. Of course, I'm, I allow the fact that it may fail, but if it succeeds, I always think somebody's going to be brilliant. And of course, yeah. looking back at it, I'm like, okay, this wasn't brilliant, but it was good enough. If I didn't think it was brilliant, I wouldn't have started in the first place. So I feel yeah. like that part is necessary in it you know, in the first stages of being in love with the work. <laughs> writing. I want to speak to you about writing because you write now and you've got a newsletter and it's a successful newsletter. Um, yeah. Just tell us about that. What, what, why, why did you start writing and kind of is, why is it beneficial kind of to you and like your whole photography brand, if you will. Brand. Huh? <laughs> um, you know, I realized uh, it's just a few things happen, I guess, all at once. I was kind of getting bored with photography. I, I get this sometimes. I felt like I've reached some kind of a dead end and I just wasn't getting inspired because I'm just sometimes you feel like you're doing the same things over and over again. And mm -hmm. when you get good at something like it feels like I can do it with my eyes closed and not in a good way, like in a, it's almost like a reflex it becomes like I'm not thinking through the situations which before they were exciting and everything was I was analyzing everything and now I'm just, I just go do it. Um, and I also realized that I can't even write a caption somehow with photography. As I started thinking of photographers say picture worth a thousand words, they don't know how to write a, to write about their work. And it was happening to me. I wasn't able to do a caption and I really didn't like that. And then just as I was thinking through these things, um, I got an offer to write a newsletter. Um, and I'm like, okay, that sounds absurd. Um, so I did it because it just sounded so outlandish. Like I didn't know how to write a caption. Um, and the process has been absolutely just, I mean, I'm, I'm loving the process. I'm like, again, learning, exciting. I am learning to think through concepts, which before I was just taking almost for granted, like every little thing that I was photographing. Now I can sit down and think through this in a way that kind of opens new doors. So I feel like I'm coming back to photography now with these, with these doors open. And I'm getting excited about photography again in turn. Excellent. That's, uh, well, that's always nice to, to, to hear. Um, because we do go through phases where we lose that kind of excitement, passion. Um, and maybe, you know, photographers who feel a bit stagnated right now and are listening to this, maybe they, maybe they could start, you know, writing and, 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 and trying to rediscover their, their love for it. And, I just wonder, how, how did you build the newsletter? How did you get it? What, what's been the best way to get eyes on your words and the photography that you write about? I mean, I try to, I advertise it through Instagram. Um, and the newsletter is on a new Facebook site. Um, they basically kind of like compare it to Substack. So they're advertising it. Um, and I'm advertising through, through Instagram, mostly mm -hmm. Instagram, Facebook, you know, I mean, social media, obviously. <laughs> and I'm trying to write about, I think I'm trying to write about relevant topics, not just kind of to have a, you know, it's not a solipsistic journey into my work. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm trying to actually talk about photography as a whole, like the world of photography and explore themes that I feel are relevant to explore. So I feel like that, I mean, those stories are definitely doing better than other stories. So mm -hmm. like I just wrote about artist statements where um, I finally admitted that I don't understand 90% of artist statements that I read in like Whitney Biennial. And it always made me feel very dumb and I finally decided, okay, I'm going to come out and write about it. It cannot be just me. I have an MFA. It cannot be just me who is not understanding artist statements. And I wrote this piece and a lot of people came out and like, oh, thank you for writing it. I also don't get them. So I feel like it's, you know, some topics just resonate with people. And I'm trying to 
you know, be honest with a conversation about photography, um, questions that I want to ask people and that I want to read about. I've not seen that particular piece that, that, that you're referencing, but it, it, I smile because I wrote an article a couple of years ago about artist statements and how there's often a lot of kind of what I described, you may disagree, but what I described as elitist language. It's kind of, you know, you have some images and then there's this body of text and you just think, what the hell does that mean? And I, I sometimes feel that photographers try and pad basic or uninspiring photography with a lot of words to make the work either sound more important or, or I don't know. I don't know why they do it. I, I, I just want to ask you kind of what, what was your take on what, why didn't you understand artist statements and, and what was kind of your conclusion through writing about them? I mean, it's what you just said. It is elitist. I mean, it's a, yeah. it's not even the photographers that I'm pointing finger at. It's the art world. I feel like in order to survive in the art world, you have to speak this art speak. And after <laughs> doing some research, um, I actually it's called International Art English. It was, I mean, cheekily called. Some uh, uh, people, I forgot the name. They wrote a paper about this uh, about 20 years ago, and they called it International Art English, and kind of traced its origins to the 1970s translations of French philosophers, mm -hmm. uh, kind of badly translated. <laughs> So this language is full of these pompous declarations and ambiguous meanings on purpose. It's kind of taking the style of French post-structuralist philosophers translated into English. Yeah. But I think it's elitist because, you know, I have two degrees, I have an MFA and I don't understand it. And I think yeah. I don't understand that or because it's really nonsense. It's a lot of virtuosity sounding prose, which makes people think they're ignorant, but it's actually, there's nothing underneath. Um, yeah. So... <laughs> I think it's there yeah. to intimidate the people into giving work meaning, for sure. Because when I read something I don't understand it, I'm inclined to think that I just don't get it, and this work mm -hmm. is above my pay grade, versus that the work may be bad. I mean, some work may be good. I've had mm -hmm. artist statements spoil good work for me, so now I'm trying to completely, you know, if I see the work that I like, I try not to even read the artist statement until I really sit with the work, and then I read it to see if it's spoiled or not. Yeah. And I think as well, I think a, a large consequence of it of, of of that kind of language, in my opinion, is it excludes a certain kind of person, it, you know, a, a certain person who's maybe from a, a different background um, in life may think, oh, I don't belong in that space because I don't speak like that and I don't use words like that. Yes. So I think we, I think we as, as a, an industry, as a whatever you want to call it, society, an art society, photography, whatever you want to say, um, we need to just I can swear on my podcast, cut the bullshit and just speak in a way <laughs> that that includes everyone and just, you know, it uh, sends a, a, a more understandable and less elitist message, if you will. Uh, one article I did write, uh, read, sorry, I've, I've, I've read a few, but one that stuck with me, um, I like personal um, stories and you spoke about your trip to Madrid, um, which started this Wonderful journey for you. Have, have I understood that correctly? Kind of, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I just, and I just wanted to kind of, in your own verbal words, kind of like how you feel about that trip now, considering everything you've done. You, you know, you, 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 I think you would agree you're having a great career. Um, and if you don't want to agree with that, then I'll say it for you. And you've got great, um, you, you do great stories in terms of your documentary work and the images uh, uh, are always strong. So when you, you think about Dina in Madrid in the past and where you are now, how do you feel about that trip? Um, very lucky. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in the beginning, it was, you're talking about, I basically took a trip to Madrid in 2007 or nine, a long, long time ago. I was just starting out as a photographer. I wasn't even a photographer yet. I had a camera. I had a camera and I took a lot of pictures. Um, and I happened to take a picture that I loved and it's, you know, it's still a decent picture. It's not amazing, but it's a decent picture. And I, but I think at the time I had this, you know, feeling of deluded optimism. That picture made me think that I'm amazing. It was one yeah. of those pictures, you know, you take when you're starting out, all of them are crap. And then there's one that's really good. You know, it's like yeah. a thousand monkeys and a thousand typewriters <laughs> uh, have the greatest novel ever written type of thing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I took this photo and I thought it was brilliant. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to go become a photographer because this photo is brilliant. And if I wasn't so deluded, I would not have done that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, 
see, it, it's a good point because I look back at some of my old work and think, how did I ever, why did I even post that online kind of thing? Do you, are you at a stage now where that stops? Or do you think if you even looked at your work two years in the past, you'd be like, oh, there's still some delusional optimism there. Do you think we always have that delusional optimism and we always realize that our work, even from maybe a couple of years in the past, isn't as strong as we are now? Or are you at a stage in your career where you're like, you know, what I do now is pretty uh, high standard and, you know, it's consistent? It's consistent. That's one <laughs> word I will use. Um, I think if I ever think my work is really high standard, I will stop doing this. I okay. mean, it's no fun. Um, no, I don't. I mean, of course, I'm not going to say, oh, I still suck. No, I'm okay. I'm fine. And of course, my work got much better through the years. You can see how this year, the amount of pictures that are crap to the amount of pictures that are good is kind of reversing in proportion. It was maybe 10% that were good before, and now it's getting more and more and more. But there's always more territories where I can get better. And mm -hmm. things that I'm already good at, I get really bored with them. Um, there's not much else to find there. So I move on to things that I'm bad at. I'm really good at finding things that I'm bad at and I try to improve until I get good and then I find another thing. Documentary photography. Um, this might sound like a stupid question and if it is one, please tell me. Um, what's more important in a documentary project? The quality of the photographs or the quality of the story? Um, this, can there be one or the other, I guess? When you mean by this story, do you mean the written story? No, just like documentary. I, I, I'm 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 speaking mostly about totally about the imagery, but you can have a collection of of photographs that that tells tells a story of of whatever you're working on. Um, and there is there are certain genres of photography, like advertising and 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 things like that, where everything has to be super duper perfect in or whatever people deem perfect to be. But with documentary, it's, I've always felt it's, we're not really analyzing the technicalities of a photograph. We're analyzing the message that it sends and what it teaches us. But I'm not a documentary photographer, I'm a consumer. So I'm asking from your perspective, do, do you get sucked into kind of how strong and technical an image is? Or are you more focused on what message the collection of photographs are sending? I mean, I guess the second one, if you can call it a message, but on the other hand, you can have a really strong message and shitty pictures, um, mm -hmm. or you can have some a story that seems like a complete trifle and you can have great pictures and make it something else. I mean, it's a bit of a dance, I guess. Yeah. Um, you can't have one without the other. If uh, that answers uh, the question. No, it does. It absolutely, it, it does because, and because I, I get sent a lot of documentary projects and there'll be times where the story is good, but the images, uh, I don't want to say bad. I don't like to say that, but they're just not there to a point where yeah. they kind of detract from the story. And then there's other times where the images technically are perfect, but the story is kind of boring or, you know, it's not really, it's not, it's not going to suck people in. Right. And and it depends what you consider the story, I guess. And, you know, anything can be a story. True. I mean, when I photographed meatpacking district, I don't know if you've seen that in a uh, project, it's yep. basically nightlife, women going out. Everybody said, what, what story is it? You've got to photograph women going out in high heels. There's no story there. Um, so I had to go and find the story there because I was seduced by the imagery. So the mm -hmm. images led me to the story, which I finally was able to flash out after three years. Uh, but in the end, there was a story, even though I didn't start with one. So I feel like those two things have to come. They have to you know, go parallel. You can't have one without the other at all. Yeah. No, you're right. And actually, so what I, so the, one thing I, I was wondering, what attracts you to a particular po project? You see an en environment and think that's visually engaging. Let's try find a story. Or do you think like, yeah, how, how do you come up with your ideas? Cause I, I, you're right. Um, your work is very diverse in, in my opinion. You know, it's, it's, um, it has the theme in terms of documentary and, and, and social kind of behaviors, but I still find the things that you, you focus on are very diverse. And I'm just wondering where your ideas come from. Do you sit in a room in silence and think, let's see what comes to my brain or. <laughs> Never. Um, I mean, my work is actually not diverse at all. It all deals okay. with the same themes. It's uh, stories that are not serious. I'm kidding about that, but it's all has to, it all has to deal with leisure. 
um, and with frivolity in a way. I mean, anything has to do with social leisure and what we do in when we are dressed, how people have fun is really kind of, you look at all my stories from where the Amish vacation, Amish on vacation, you know, um, <laughs> even though it's Amish, it may seem completely different from meatpacking district, but essentially it's the same. Meatpacking oh, yeah. district is people unwinding after a hard week of work. So mm -hmm. I'm all constantly looking at people. Um, yeah, you know, now I'm not picking kind of political or news stories, you know, I'm kind of picking the stories in between. Okay, well, Dina, um, we spoke about a lot there, and it's been very insightful and, and, and enjoyable, and I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to, to have a chat with me. Um, I'm going to do the usual, we'll put links to your newsletter uh, in an article for the website, and I'll do links to your socials. There's no point you telling them people where they are, because people forget. So we'll put it in text, and then they can click on it, and they can... They can see your wonderful stuff, which I encourage everybody to do because um, I've looked at your newsletter and it, it's, you know, there's, there's a lot of varied kind of photography stuff in there. And I think there's something in there for everyone. So, um, so yeah, so thanks again. And um, I will let you get on with your day. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Well, thanks once again to Dina for speaking with me. If you want to check out more of her work or subscribe to her newsletter, then be sure to check out her links in the description below. Guys, we will be back again next week. But before I let you go, just a quick reminder, do subscribe on YouTube, hit a like, leave a comment. What did you think to this week's episode? Who do you like to see on future episodes? And of course, if you're listening via Google, Spotify or Apple Podcasts, be sure to subscribe and you'll never miss an episode. I'll be back again next week. This has been the Photographers Inside the Photographer's Mind. I've been Dan Jin. See ya.